Right so then, we are at Romans chapter 10. Let's ask for Lord's blessing. Come, blessed Holy Spirit, open the word to us. Open our hearts. Teach us to see that Jesus is Savior and Lord, that we might be saved. Amen. Romans chapter 10. Paul is talking about his own people, Israel, and this is how he brings them the gospel. Follow along if you would. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we proclaim, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Look, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Well, how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? Well, how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? So it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. They've not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed what he's heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I am not ashamed of this gospel. All right. um, Can we just back that mic off just a little bit, please? That would be good because I'm going to get really loud and I don't want to shock them. Not really. So we're deep into the book of Romans. And we know that the theme that we've discovered all through these months of Romans is the gospel. Gospel is good news. It is tidings, a story that is proclaimed of something wonderful that has happened. And the gospel is that God has not forgotten the people he created. He's not left us on our own. Rather, he has come to us. He has put on a skin suit and entered the world and walked among us in Jesus Christ. That is the good news. That is the amazing story. And that walking among us in Christ, he lived as a man the life of righteousness, of obedience to his father and love for his fellows that we could not live. That he then went and died, convicted of sins he did not commit, in order that he might enfold our sins upon his death on the cross. That dying and being buried on the third day, he rose from the dead, breaking the power and the grip of death over all humans and offering to us that everlasting life so that we can be part of the amazing redemption and transformation of the whole cosmos that he's after. That's the gospel. That is the good news that God has stepped into his world to redeem it. It's the most amazing story ever uttered by human lips. It's the truest of true things. It's beautiful beyond compare that this is how the creator of the universe determines to save us in his weakness becoming what we are, coming to us as we are in order to fix us from the inside out. Who doesn't want to hear this news? Well, evidently, lots of people. In Romans 9 through 11, Paul is puzzling over the fact that his own people by blood, his kinsmen, Israel, by and large, rejected the gospel. They stumbled over this news. They didn't want it. How could that be? Well, think about it. It is kind of bizarre, isn't it? 
I mean, what is all this talk about redemption and righteousness and sin and being saved? Saved from what? What do I need to be saved from? And what does the activities and words of some guy who lived 2,000 years ago actually have to do with how I'm getting along in the world and in my life today? Are you telling me that there are situations that I cannot solve without the help of a guy who lived 2,000 years ago? Succinctly? Yep. Yes. The gospel is about the reality that there are situations that occur in my life which I cannot solve on my own. These situations are revealed by three questions that every human being who lives long enough to think will ask in her or his heart of hearts. Three crucial questions that no one escapes and that on our own we are incapable of answering. What are these three questions? I'm so glad you asked. Slide that decimal point on your pledge card and I'll give them to you. (laughs) Actually, I'll tell it to you for free. Actually, I'll pay you to listen to them. They emerge as we study Romans 10. Here's how it goes. Let's take a look at two very enigmatic verses. Man, that's popping a lot. Okay, let's take a look at two weird verses from Romans 10. Paul says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down. Do not say who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Now when I read that studying, I felt a great sigh of relief. For once, here's a command in the Bible I can keep. I don't wanna ask that question. Do not say who will ascend into heaven. Okay, I won't. Do not say who will descend into the deep. Fine, at last, this is something I can obey. I mean, honestly, have you asked that question this week? Hmm, who will descend into the deep for me? Probably not. But what I've learned about Scripture is that almost always when I'm studying, the place I don't want to go is the place where God wants to speak. The thing that seems the weirdest, the strangest, or the hardest is actually the place where the most energy and transformation will occur. So I thought about this a long time through the years and discovered that actually these are two questions we, these are two of the three by the way, we are all asking all the time. Let's start with the first one. Who will ascend into heaven? It's related to an overall category of questions. Who's gonna go where I can't go to get what I need for situations I cannot solve? Who's going to go where I can't go to get what I need for situations I have to solve for myself, but I can't solve by myself. Here's the first one. Am I alone? Am I alone in the end? In the end, is all my thought about God, all my prayer, all my desires, really just about the chemicals that are running around inside my skull? Is every worship impulse just electrical charges going through my brain and never actually leaving my body so that when I die, in the end, I'm all alone at the last? It's just me isolated in the cosmos. Ultimately, that's a question we ask. Is there someone out there or are we just little isolated animals that happen by chance and will disappear? That's the question that underlies a situation I can't solve, which is, I am lonely. I am spiritually lonely for the God who made me, that I intuit, that I grope for, that I feel like must be there, but I cannot be sure. Who will go where I can't go to solve the situations I can't solve? Who's gonna go up into heaven and come back and say, yes, there is a God and he loves you? and he can fill your loneliness. I think it's really interesting that the man who discovered and proved scientifically that there is a vacuum was Blaise Pascal. He lived in the 17th century, and he proved through some very clever use of jars that up in space there is nothing, not air and light, but nothing, just nothing, a vacuum, the absence of everything. Now Pascal proved that and then went on in his faith to write that inside every human being there is a vacuum, a nothingness, which happens to be God-shaped. 
Now we try to put all kinds of stuff into that vacuum to fill the loneliness, adventure, travel, achievement, and my personal favorite, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We put anything that we can into the vacuum hoping it will fill up and stay filled. But the conundrum that we're in is that the more stuff we put in it, the more it disappears and the vacuum remains because what Pascal discovered is that it's God-shaped. Only God can fill the vacuum inside the soul that he created. By the way, Pascal also invented the modern adding machine, among a few other things. He's a smart guy. You should read what he wrote. Well, before Pascal, there was Augustine who lived in the fourth century. His most famous words were these. You have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. I'm lonely for someone to tell me I'm not alone. I'm lonely from the inside out for the God who made me, and I long to have him fill the vacuum with presence. But who will go where I can't go to solve this situation? Am I all alone? The second question is similar to it, and that's this. Is there more? Second question, is there more life after this life, or is this it? It's the question of the situation of my mortality. There is nothing that I can do to stop my loved ones from being taken from me by death. Sooner or later, it will happen. And there's not a thing I can do about the fact that this carcass can and will decay. And even though I can prolong it by a few years, one way or the other, by what I do and by sheer luck, I'm going to die. And I want to know what comes next. Who will go where I can't go to solve the situation of the fact that you die and I die and we don't know what comes next? That's the unsolvable question. What happens after this? Because if I knew, it would tell me a lot about how to live. Back in the late 16th century, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. And remember Hamlet's problem? Faced with the betrayal of his own father by and his mother and the death of his father, he thought, why should I even live? Who would go on living in a world as awful as this except that we don't know what's coming? Let me read to you what he said. This is such a great quote. He said, who would continue to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from which no traveler returns, causes us to endure the troubles now rather than risk what we know not will come. Pretty good, huh? Back in the 16th century, they were thinking the same thing. Who will go where I cannot go to solve the problem of my mortality? Is this all there is or is there more? I hope that there's more. I hope that this isn't just the end. Even children ask this question because as I mentioned, they're as smart as the adults. My dog died. My grandmother died. Is that the end? Where are they? Am I alone? Is there more life to come? Here's the third one. Am I okay? Am I all right? Am I right in myself? Am I okay with others? Am I fine before God? I don't know if there's a God. I hope that there's someone out there. I suspect that there's a life to come. When I arrive before him, how will it be with me? Do I have enough going that should I appear before a personal creator if one exists, am I okay? That question arises from a situation that haunts me in the middle of the night and I suspect it does you as well. When there are no other props around, when there's nothing you can do, when you're lying in the dark and you wonder, did I do enough? And what about the damage I did? And what about the things that I thought? And what about all that's in me that is disturbed and poisoned and wrong and reaching and lustful and vicious and violent? Am I okay in myself? I don't feel okay. I feel all wrong. Who will go where I cannot go? 
to solve situations I cannot solve? Is there any rightness for me? Paul noted that his people, Israel, specialized in trying to be right before God. They wanted to keep the law. So he says that what they tried to do was, not knowing the righteousness that comes from God as a gift, they sought to establish their own righteousness so they did not submit to God's righteousness. Unpack that a bit. It's what we all want to do, isn't it? I want to make myself okay. Presbyterians are wonderful at this. We are historically high achievers active in the community, we serve in government, we serve as teachers, we serve in community outreaches, all across the board through the centuries. Presbyterians are high on working out the righteousness of God. So was Israel. They had the law and the prophets. But the problem comes when we take responding to God's word into establishing our own selves before God and relying on us. In other words, saying, I got this. I know I'm okay. I've done enough. If someone says to you, how do you know you're okay? You say, well, you know, at least I went to an SEC school and it wasn't named Allah. I mean, at least I went to an SEC school and, you know, at least I've got a family and at least I'm doing these things. But in our heart of hearts, we're wondering, is that sufficient? And Paul's setting it up. When we want to establish our own righteousness and be okay in ourselves, we fail to submit, to bow the head and to say to God, I can't. You can and only you can. Who's going to give me the fineness, the rightness that I don't have? Well, here's why Paul said, don't say in your heart, who's going to go up to heaven to bring Christ down? Don't say, who's going down to the depths to bring Christ up? Why? Because the question has already been answered. He says, this is what the scripture says. The word is near you. It's in your heart. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the situations I cannot solve in myself. Saved from the deep spiritual loneliness for the God I was made for but do not know. Saved from the fear that there is nothing after this life but non-existence, or worse, that there is a judgment I cannot endure. Saved from trying to make myself okay in myself and failing. Because the gospel news is that one has come. One has come down from heaven to show you that God is smiling in the face of Jesus upon you to show you that God's arms are outstretched to say, I'm here, I made you, and I desire to fill your loneliness with my presence. The gospel news is that one has come to go down into the realm of death to die on behalf of all men and women in order to come back and say, I've been in the grave and now it's empty, I'm out. And I wanna give you life in itself, life that goes on forever. One has come to live a life of rightness before his father, of utter love and sacrifice before his fellows, and to say, I can confer that rightness on you. That one is Jesus Christ, the Lord. God has come. He's not hiding. His arms are outstretched. He's not pretending. He's speaking his word right into your hearts. The question becomes, do you believe it and will you confess it? For if one confesses with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved in all the fullness of that word. Well, here's the deal. You can't make yourself believe it. Faith is a gift. I can't make you believe it. But faith comes from hearing. Hearing comes from the word of God. And so the question becomes, hearing God's word, hearing the gospel, ask yourself this. Is God creating faith in me right now? Is he stirring in my heart 
to acknowledge I cannot solve the situation of my loneliness, my mortality, and my not rightness. But I want Jesus to solve it for me. Jesus said in Revelation 3, look, I'm standing at the door, I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and has faith enough to open the door, I will come in and live with him, sup with him, fellowship with him, and he with me. We're gonna get really basic here in a moment. I'm gonna ask you to confess with your lips and to pray with your heart that Jesus is the one who solves you from these unsolvable things. It involves great simplicity and utter release of all trying to establish myself as the one who can solve mortality and loneliness and wrongness. But calling to him saying, Lord, you must. Maybe you've never done that before. You've said it all your life, but you've not added the heart to the words. Or maybe years ago you said it, but you've spent the rest of your life trying to serve two masters, trying to not make sure that you don't look like a fanatic or one of those weird religious people. And so you are already lonely for the God you already have. Whatever the situation, if you know the gospel, rejoice to affirm it. And if you make a decision, don't let the day pass without sealing the deal by speaking to someone about it. Following our service, out that door and to the left is a prayer room. There will be pastors and elders there to pray with you or email me or call me or something. But if you confess with your lips and believe in your heart and you know your salvation, share it. It locks it in and gives you assurance like nothing else. One has come, dear ones, to go where we cannot go, to do what we cannot do in order that in him we might be saved. So really, basically, I'm going to ask you in a moment to close your eyes, and I'm going to say a prayer, and I'm going to invite everyone to speak it aloud, to echo me, and to know the truth. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Repeat after me if you would. Lord Jesus, I confess. There are questions I cannot answer. Situations I cannot solve. But you can. You wash away sin. Cleanse me. You answer loneliness. Fill me. You give eternal life. Open heaven to me. I believe you rose. I accept your lordship over me. I take you as my savior. Amen. You prayed that prayer with your heart as well as with your lips. Know the truth. The Lord has promised that he comes to dwell with you. He will never leave you. He has washed clean your sins, granted you his spirit everlastingly, and promised you eternal life. Thanks be to God.